Okay, we might run out of uh, storage space. But it, it says here in Testimonies, Volume 5, page 728, it says, the Jews were looking for the Messiah, but he did not come as they had predicted that he would. And if he were acknowledged, accepted as the promised one, their learned teachers would be forced to acknowledge that they had erred. These teachers had separated themselves from God, and Satan worked upon their minds to lead them to reject the Savior. Rather than yield their pride of opinion, they closed their eyes to all the evidences of his messiahship. And they not only rejected the message of salvation themselves, but they steeled the hearts of the people against Jesus. Their history should be a solemn warning to us. We need never expect that when the Lord has light for his people, Satan will stand calmly by and make no effort to prevent them from receiving it. He will work upon minds to excite distrust and jealousy and unbelief. Let us beware that we do not refuse the light God sends because it does not come in a way to please us. Let not God's blessing be turned away from us because we know not the time of our visitation. Excuse me. If there are any who do not see and accept the light themselves, let them not stand in the way of others. Let it not be said of this highly favored people, as of the Jews, when the good news of the kingdom was preached to them, ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. Okay, so you see here that, according to this reading, that in the past, you know, the Jews were looking for the Messiah, but they had their preconceived ideas as to how he would come. And because they did not, he did not come in the way they thought, they rejected him as the Messiah. And especially the leaders who were teaching the people a certain way um, did not want to admit that they were wrong. And so instead of making the corrections, they steal the hearts of the people against Jesus, referring to him as a false messiah. Any thoughts? Anyone would like to, you know, make a comment on the reading before we go to pray? Uh, if not, let me go to Brother Joel, if you're there. Oops, that's you. I will unmute Brother Joel. Are you there? Are you able to get, to get me? Okay, we hear you now, Brother. All right. Okay. Uh, it's for the prayer, right? Yes, for the prayer. All right. Unless you have a comment you want to make before you pray. Uh, no, no, no. All right. Uh, pray. Okay. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you once again for uh, bringing us here to come and uh, uh, worship you, Heavenly Father, to learn about your way, Heavenly Father. Before we delve more into this lesson, Heavenly Father, we just want to pray to give us our sins that are committed knowing and knowing, Heavenly Father. I uh, just want to pray that you open up the minds of everyone here, Heavenly Father. Even so bless us, Heavenly Father. Even bless those that are not yet here, Heavenly Father. They can come and listen to your word, Heavenly Father. Be with uh, the leader of uh, Heavenly Father this discussion. Be with, uh, be with him, Heavenly Father. Send him the Holy Spirit so that he can uh, guide us to all in this lesson, Heavenly Father. Same we pray, thank you in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Okay, thank you, brother. Okay. So let us go to our PowerPoint. The Great Paradox of the Ages, Zechariah 6, verses 1 through 8. Okay, our study is taken from Zechariah chapter 6. It is a subject that is not often understood. Nonetheless, it is an important and crucial study for us today especially for those of the remnant church. Though this study may be new to us, we should not take it as something which cannot be understood. Inspiration says in Great Controversy, page 606, In every generation, God has sent his servants to rebuke sin, both in the world and in the church. But the people desire smooth things spoken to them, and the pure, unvarnished truth is not acceptable. Many reformers, in entering upon their work, determined to exercise great prudence in attacking the sins of the church and the nation. They hoped, by the example of a pure Christian life, to lead the people back to the doctrines of the Bible. But the Spirit of God came upon them as it came upon Elijah, moving him to rebuke the sins of a wicked king and an apostate people. They could not refrain from preaching the plain utterances of the Bible, doctrines which they had been reluctant to present. They were impelled to zealously declare the truth and the danger which threatened souls. The words which the Lord gave them they uttered, fearless of consequences, and the people were compelled to hear the warning. Thus the message of the third angel will be proclaimed. As the time comes for it to be given with greatest power, the Lord will work through humble instruments leading the minds of those who consecrate themselves to his service. The laborers will be qualified rather by the unction of his spirit than by the training of literary institutions. Men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal, declaring the words which God gives them. Great Controversy, page 606. We have truly come to a time in the history of this world in which the Lord has sent a special message to his people. Should we not then open our hearts and minds to the word of God as we look now into Zechariah chapter 6? Let us begin by reading verses 1 through 8. And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. In the first chariot were red horses, and in the second chariot black horses, and in the third chariot white horses, and in the fourth chariot grizzled and bay horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my lord? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. 
the black horses which are therein go forth into the north country, and the white go forth after them, and the grizzle go forth toward the south country. And the bay went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, Get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. Then cried he upon me, and spake unto me, saying, Behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. Zechariah 6, verses 1 through 8. Here it tells us of two brass mountains. From between these two brass mountains there came four chariots. Pulling the first chariot were red horses. Pulling the second chariot were black horses. Pulling the third chariot were white horses. And the last chariot is being pulled by the grizzled and the bay horses. What does all this mean? What is the message that God is endeavoring to get across in these verses? As we are now being given an understanding of Zechariah chapter 6, it must be something that is important for us to understand in these last days. Different private interpretations are given for this study in Zechariah 6. But the safest way to understand prophecy is to go back to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and let them speak for themselves. As there are no literal brass mountains, this prop prophecy must be speaking symbolically. Therefore, to understand this prophecy, we must go back to the very beginning of Zechariah 6 and start with the two brass mountains. What do they symbolize and why are they brass? What do the mountains symbolize? In Zechariah 8, verse 3, we read, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. So here in Zechariah, we notice that God is using a mountain to symbolize his church, Zion, Jerusalem. Also, in the book of Daniel, we see a mountain symbolizing God's people. In Daniel 9, verse 16, we read, O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Daniel prays for God's people or church, Jerusalem, and compares them to a holy mountain. Daniel could not be praying for a literal mountain because literal mountains do not sin. In Isaiah 2, verses 2 and 3, we read, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Is God saying here 
that he is going to take a literal mountain, mountain and stack it on top of the mountains? No. Obviously, he is referring to his church, his people. His church is likened unto a mountain. But his mountain, God's church, in the last days, is going to be exalted above all the other churches, all the other mountains. I think something went wrong here. Let me go forward again. Okay. Now, why are the mountains brass? Brass is a metal that has everlasting qualities and does not deteriorate. It is used in building ships because brass does not deteriorate or rust. Seeing that the two mountains in Zechariah are both brass, it shows God church in two different periods of time, each having enduring and spirit-filled qualities, strong like brass. The only two churches that meet this description would be the early Christian church, Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, and the SVA church in its purified state, Joel 2, 28 and 29. In Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, we read, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles. We notice here that the church went forth from then on proclaiming the gospel with power, a church, as it were, purified and of one accord. Thus, it is a perfect symbol of the first brass mountain, a church spirit-filled, strong and sound. Amen. But what about the second brass mountain? In Joel 2.28 we read, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. The prophet Joel is telling us of a time when the Seventh-day Adventist church will be purified like the early Christian church was and be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Inspiration gives us a description of that church. In Prophet and Kings, page 725, we read, Clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness, the church is to enter upon her final conflict, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. Song of Solomon 610. She is to go forth into all the world, conquering and to conquer. Here it is reiterating that what we read in Joel, describing the second brass mountain. Thus we have seen that the two great churches, brass mountains, here mentioned in Zechariah 6, are the early Christian church and the purified Seventh-day Adventist church, both filled with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So then, what does the valley between the mountains represent? Well, before we go into that, um, 
If you have a question or a comment, you can just raise your hand, uh, look in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, and you can touch what looks like a question mark, and you'll be added to the queue. Uh, if not, we will continue on. Okay, if there be no questions or comments, we shall continue. So what does the value, valley between the mountains represent? Okay, I see a hand. Let's take this hand before we go on. Yes, I'm just looking at the chart. This is Brother David. Look at the chart and wondering what... Um, the significance of the year 508 is... Oh, okay. Um, well, let's get through the study, and then we can um, come back to those numbers. It will make, I guess, more sense uh, towards the end of the study. Okay. okay. Just uh, finally remind me. Thank you for that question. Okay, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3, speaking of the valley. The Apostle Paul says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The Apostle Paul is telling us that sometime after the early Christian church reached its peak, there was to come a falling away before the coming of the Lord. And this is precisely what we see here in Zechariah 6. There is a period of time, a valley and space, between the two mountains, indicating that falling away period. It is between these two mountains that the four chariots are seen coming. What do the chariots and horses represent? First, what do horses symbolize in the scriptures? To find our answer, let us turn to Zechariah 1, verses 8 through 11. I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. And he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom. And behind him were there red horses, speckled and white. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are they whom the Lord had sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sits still and is at rest. Here we see horses that are symbolic. We notice because they were sent by the Lord, and the horses here are speaking. Literal horses do not have the gift of speech. Therefore, these horses must be referring, referring to humans who speak, such as Bible workers and Christians who declare the word of God. Inspiration gives us further insight in Testimonies to Ministers, page 489. 
The spasmodic, fitful movements of some who claim to be Christians is well represented by the work of strong but untrained horses. Zechariah 10.3 For the Lord of hosts hath visited his flock, the house of Judah, and hath made them as his goodly horse in the battle. So here we see in both the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy that horses are used to symbolize workers for the Lord. Zechariah himself had a question as to the meaning of these horses. He says, Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. Zechariah 6, 4 and 5. What are the four spirits that God sends throughout the world? It must be the Holy Spirit working through God's servants, the horses, with heaven-sent messages. We know the Holy Spirit works through human agents to accomplish its task of taking truth to the world. In John 15, 26, we read, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Here we are told that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. Clearly, these horses and the chariots they pull must be people filled with heaven-sent messages. So here in Zechariah, God is depicting his church being commissioned with heaven-sent messages and proclaiming the gospel during the time between the two brass mountains. The spirit of prophecy gives us further insight. There is no need of anyone to being in ignorance. We must clear the king's highway. For God will remove hindrances out of the way. God calls you to come up to his help against the mighty. Instead of pressing your weight against the chariot of truth that is being pulled up an inclined road, you should work with all the energy you can summon to push it on. Review and Herald, March 18, 1890, paragraph 5. Here, inspiration likens the chariot, the church, to a chariot of truth, and we are told to push it and guide it along. Thus, in Zechariah, God is likening his church to chariots being led by horses. But, why the various colors of the horses? Okay. Uh, before we get into the color, uh, we will take any hands, any comments on what we covered thus far. If it is clear, okay, sister, Lenny. Yes, Brother Terry. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. You have to. Doesn't We're not hearing you too clearly. Can you get oh. closer to your mic? The horses, um, do they, they don't necessarily mean um, leaders. They just mean as long as you accept Christ and um, you are living up to the light and to the truth, you are considered to, to, to be a horse. <laughs> like, well, uh. the, the, the symbols. <laughs> Because oh, okay. I, thought, I thought they were like leaders, the fact that they were pulling the chariots. Okay. Um, in the terms of the grizzled horses, yes, it represents leadership. Um, now, you have two, two um, classes of people, those who lead and those who follow. However, in its in truest sense, even the followers of Christ 
should be able to give a reason for the hope that is in them. We should be able to explain why we believe what we believe and not have to call upon, you know, an elder or a pastor or someone. We should be intelligent in our beliefs, knowing why we believe and, and, and you know, what we believe. We may not be eloquent speakers. Uh, we may not remember everything at our fingertips, but we should have a pretty good idea, understanding of why we believe what we believe and be able to at least explain it to some degree to those who ask us. So in, in, in a secondary sense, we, are, we will be like leaders because um, if you take, for instance, the example given in the, um, the study of the, the, the flood, um, I'm, I'm sorry, the trumpets, we had talked about the trees, you know, um, those who entered the ark were likened unto trees. Um, mm -hmm. Even in Psalms 1, you know, um, those who uh, serve the Lord are likened to a tree planted by the rivers of water. So that's how God's believers, you know, his followers should be. So now in, in this study of Zechariah 6, it is breaking it down, I guess, a little more precisely in the sense that, you know, the horses and the chariot are considered the leadership. Yes, uh, those who are at the forefront of the work. Okay. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay, if no other questions, comments, we shall... Continue. Why the various colors of the horses? The color of the horses must mean something since the horses represent people. The colors must show the circumstance, time, and the condition of the people of God. Therefore, Since the horses are pulling the chariots, the horses must symbolize leaders. The chariot itself must symbolize the followers or church members. Hence, the horses and chariots represent heaven-born messages carried by the church on the earth during the time between the two glorious churches or the two brass mountains. Who is represented by the red horses? Red in the scriptures has at least two meanings, sin or bloodshed. Here in Zechariah 6, it must symbolize bloodshed for the chariots are from the Lord. See verse 5. And this is precisely the case. After the early Christian church had reached its peak, the first grass mountain, the church went forth in the earth proclaiming the gospel. There followed a period of great persecution, as we see in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Great Controversy, page 40. Great numbers sealed their testimony with their blood. Noble and slave, rich and poor, learned and ignorant, were alike slain without mercy. Thus, the color red is a fitting symbol of bloodshed. For further proof, we can read early writings, pages 18 and 19. I noticed red as a border on their garments. Their crowns were brilliant. Their robes were pure white. As we greeted them, I asked Jesus who they were. He said they were martyrs that had been slain for him. Yes. 
Can you imagine being those who were in the, you know, Colosseum and lions and other ferocious beasts were coming out after you for the sport of the multitude? Lord have mercy. In Zechariah 6, 6 and 7, we read, The black horses which are therein go forth into the north country, and the white go forth after them, and the grizzle go forth toward the south country, and the bay went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. Notice that the angel informed Zechariah of the direction of each chariot except the red, indicating again that as far as their final destination is concerned, the red horses went nowhere as they were martyred for their faith. Thus, it is clear that the first chariot pulled by a red set of horses is picturing Christians martyred for the Lord. Who is represented by the black horses? Well, again, before we move on, was there any question on the red horses? Any comments? Why red? Again, as was brought out in the reading, <clears throat> it cannot be sin because the Lord, they, these four spirits came from the Lord. And the Lord does not send sin throughout the earth. Amen? <clears throat> okay, so who is represented by the black horses? <clears throat> okay, brother, we have a question here or a comment. Brother Louis? morning happy sabbath happy sabbath um, i like the picture of the horse but when you say horses and then you're showing one horse maybe if you had several of them it would have been the lesson because it's saying one thing but it's showing something else different it's showing one horse while you say black horses red horses and every time it's showing one horse but it's missing horses Okay, <clears throat> well... Um, so maybe if you put several of those, it will look, it will bring out the picture, but having one and then saying it, you know, for, for people who are learning, it's um, because, you know, inspiration said the, the pictures are, are, the symbols that you look at is easier for people to grasp because of looking, they can learn. But if you're saying one thing and then showing something different, maybe if you put the ones in the chariot, um, with the horses instead of one horse and same horses, it would bring the lesson more. Of course, you know, we can't improve on inspiration, so we put the horses. Okay. Just, just a right. thought, um, as you mm -hmm. read and, and try to <coughs> up, you know, kind of confusing this, this situation. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Um, I have seen another hand. Okay, I guess maybe it was a mistake. All right, Zechariah 6, verse 2. And in the second chariot, black horses. Black is a symbol of bondage and spiritual darkness. The period of martyrdom was followed by the dark ages of religion. 538 to 1798 AD. The black horses preached in this prophetic period when God's true church was subjected to papal bondage and spiritual darkness. Okay, before I go on, I see the hand again. Brother Louis? Yeah, um, I'm sorry, I was <laughs> mute myself, so uh, I didn't realize that. That's why this is a Deborah already uh, got before me. Uh, this is a 
Host is also, did they represent the NAR? Uh, uh, did they, uh, as they has to go out, did they have like a, they pray the water like a messenger? Uh, are they, are they, uh, can and you they repeat that question? Yeah, a messenger, like they, uh, they, they carry the message? No? Yes, well, um, gospel workers or those who preach, you know, the word of God are messengers in that sense. You know, we are carrying the message of salvation. And so, um, you know, they are, you know, messengers. Oh, oh, okay. So that's the reason why they were the host, because they, they can't go further because they, they, not be able to fulfill their uh, their duty or their their uh, what they supposed to do because they been um, uh, what you call it? Uh, get killed or martyred or something like this. Right? Yes, they they were they were cut off in their work. They were martyred. So oh, okay. as they're trying to preach, you know, um, Christ, um, they were they were slain. So that's why it says um, that there was no destination given for those red horses. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Amen. Okay. So the black horses symbolize bondage and spiritual darkness. Who is represented by the white horses? In Zechariah 6 3, we read, and in the third chariot, white horses. White is opposite of black. Black, you recall, symbolized darkness and spiritual bondage. White, therefore, is a symbol of purity and liberty. What movement after 1798 could these white horses represent? To get our answer, let us turn to the great controversy. In Great Controversy, page 401, we read, Of all the great religious movements since the days of the apostles, none have been more free from human imperfection and the wiles of Satan than was that of the autumn of 1844. It is a fact that sometime after 1798, the Millerite movement went forth proclaiming the gospel. It is described in the book of Revelation as the Church of Philadelphia, a church that had not a single rebuke from the Lord. Let us read Revelation 3, 7 and 8. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. The Millerites were known as the Church of Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. We notice that they were also free from condemnation. This further reveals that the Millerite movement is best represented by the white horses, the church just before Laodicea, the last church. In Zechariah 6.6, 6, we are told that the black horses which are therein go forth into the north country, and the white go forth after them. So what is the meaning of the north country? To answer our question, let us turn to Ezekiel 26, from verse 7. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, 
I will bring upon Tyrus, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings from the north. The north country is the biblical term for ancient Babylon. But as we are dealing with the New Testament era, the north country has reference to modern Babylon or apostate Christianity, which includes the papacy. This is further explained in Great Controversy, page 382. Babylon is said to be the mother of harlots. By her daughters must be symbolized churches that cling to her doctrines and traditions and follow her example of sacrificing the truth and the approval of God in order to form an unlawful alliance with the world. G.C., page 382. Apostate Protestants, daughters, are included in the term Babylon. Thus the Millerites also preached in the North Country to Catholics and Protestants. In Zechariah 6, 8, we are told, Then cried he upon me, and spake unto me, saying, Behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. What is the meaning of the phrase, quieted my spirit in the north country? Since the churches of Miller's day rejected the first angel's message, Babylon fell and the Holy Spirit was withdrawn or quieted in the north country. Thus, when the black and white horses preached in the Catholic and Protestant churches, their rejection of the truth quieted God's spirit with them. Thus far, we have seen that the first brass mountain represents the early Christian church. The second brass mountain, the purified SDA church. <clears throat> the valley between these two mountains represent time between these two glorious churches. The horses represent preachers slash teachers that carry heaven sent messages to the world. The red horses symbolize the martyrs. The black horses taught during the Dark Ages. The white horses represent the Millerite movement, the Church of Philadelphia. The last chariot is symbolized by the church that followed the Millerite movement the Church of Laodicea. Since the first three chariots embraced the history of the Church up to 1844, the fourth chariot must represent a church or organization that followed the Millerite movement. The only church that fits this description is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Okay. Hmm. In Zechariah six, verses three, six, and seven, we read. And in the fourth chariot grizzled and bay horses. And the grizzle go forth toward the south country. And the bay went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. This last chariot is a picture of our church in its present condition. It is showing two sets of horses 
going in two different directions. They are not working together. They are working at cross purposes. The grizzled want to go toward the south country and the bay want to go throughout the whole earth, thus indicating that there is a struggle, a shaking going on in the church. Who is, represent, who is represented by the grizzle horses and who is represented by the bay horses? As we see two sets of horses, the grizzles and the bay, this would indicate that there are two types of leadership. What is the meaning of the color grizzles and what is the meaning of the color bay? Grizzle is a color that is neither white nor black, indefinite, a faint grayish spotted color. This denotes hypocrisy. Thus, the first set of leaders are not true Christians or fully worldlings. The grizzled horses are the ones first seen and are now leading the chariot, church members, toward the south country, verse 6. They symbolize the leaders who are in the forefront, the general conference. What is the meaning of the south country? The biblical term for the south country is Egypt, Genesis 20, verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. Abraham was on the very border of Egypt. Sister White makes an interesting comment in volume 5, page 217. She says, The church has turned back from following Christ her leader and is steadily retreating toward Egypt. Yet few are alarmed or astonished at their want of spiritual power. Doubt and even disbelief of the testimonies of the Spirit of God is leavening our churches everywhere. In other words, the SVA church has turned back from following Christ and is going toward the world, worldliness. We are dressing like the world, we are eating like the world, we are following worldly principles in our social affairs, in our schools, and in our hospitals. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is not Babylon and never will be, according to Testimonies to Ministers, pages 50, 58, and 59. But we are becoming like her in our affairs. Clearly then, the grizzled horses have strayed off the path and are leading God's church into worldliness, Egypt, and away from their God-given mission to go into all the world. Inspiration further states, the people of God will be tested and proved. A close and searching work must go on among Sabbath keepers like ancient Israel. How soon we forget God and his wondrous works and rebel against them. Some look to the world and desire to follow its fashions and participate, participate in its pleasure. Just as the children of Israel looked back to Egypt, and lusted for the good things which they had enjoyed there. Testimonies, Volume 1, pages 287 and 288. In Testimonies, Volume 2, page 124, we read, Great light has been shining upon the church, and by it they are condemned because they refuse to walk in the light of it to walk in it. If they were blind, they would be without sin. 
For they have seen light and have heard much truth, yet are not wise and holy. Many have for years made no advancement in knowledge and true holiness. They are spiritual dwarfs. Instead of going forward to perfection, they are going back to the darkness and bondage of Egypt. Their minds are not exercised unto godliness and true holiness. Testimonies, Volume 2, page 124. So who does the bay-colored horse represent? The bay color denotes strength. See your Bible margin, if you have a margin in your Bible. The bay horses can also be rendered as strong. So the bay color denotes strength. The second set of horses are true Christian leaders, strong in the Lord and eager to go. Okay, so you see here, picture of a margin. Strong, strong steeds to eager to go. They must be God's chosen leaders, not recognized by man and not in the forefront. They are pulling in another direction, trying to finish the gospel, walk to and fro through the earth. Verse 7. Here we see a paradox. A conflict is taking place in God's remnant church between Christ and Satan and their respective servants, horses. Each is striving to gain hold of the chariot. One set of horses is leading the church to the south country, Egypt, worldliness. The other set of horses or trying to lead the church into all the world to finish the gospel. However, both are in the same church, SDA, hitched together by the traces. God is telling us that before the gospel is to be preached in all the world, there must be a separation between these two classes of saints, because they are working at cross purposes. In early writings, page 270, we read, I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it. And this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. In volume 6, page 371, we read, the law does not now work to bring many souls into the truth because of the church members who have never been converted and those who were once converted but who have backslidden. What influence would these unconsecrated members have on new converts? Would they not make of no effect the God-given message which his people ought to bear? This is why the church has to be purified. The trace is cut before the gospel can be carried to and fro to the world. What allows the Bay leaders to take the chariot? We read in Zechariah 6, 7, And the Bay went forth, and sought to go, that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, Get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. 
The separation is directed by an angel, showing that this work is done by God. Evidently, it is the separation of the wheat and tares, the time of Ezekiel chapter 9. <clears throat> Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 47. The time of the harvest will fully determine the character of the two classes specified under the figure of the tares and the wheat. The work of separation is given to the angels of God and not committed into the hands of any man. Amen. In Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, pages 266 and 267, we read, The true people of God, who have the spirit of the work of the Lord and the salvation of souls at heart, will ever view sin in its real sinful character. They will always be on the side of faithful and plain dealing with sins which easily beset the people of God, especially in the closing work for the church in the sealing time of the 144,000 who are to stand without fault before the throne of God will they feel most deeply the wrongs of God's professed people. This is forcibly set forth by the prophet's illustration of the last work under the figure of the men each having a slaughter weapon in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry, for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 266. Those who receive the pure mark of truth wrought in them by the power of the Holy Ghost, represented by a mark by the man in linen, are those that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the church. Their love for purity and the honor and glory of God is such, and they have so clear a view of the exceeding sinfulness of sin that they are represented as being in agony, even sighing and crying. Read the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. Volume 3, 267. Okay, now we'll take a look at Manuscript Release, Volume 1, page 260. And here it says, Study the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. These words will be literally fulfilled. Yet the time is passing, and the people are asleep. They refuse to humble their souls and be converted. Not a great while longer will the Lord bear with the people who have such great and important truths revealed to them, but who refuse to bring these truths into their individual experience. The time is short. God is calling. Will you hear? Will you receive his message? Will you be converted before it is too late? Soon, very soon, every case will be decided for eternity. Again, Manuscript Release, Volume 1, page 260. In Volume 3 of the 1888 Materials, page 1303, the time will soon come when the prophecy of Ezekiel 9 will be fulfilled. That prophecy should be carefully studied, for it will be fulfilled to the very letter. Study also the 10th chapter, which represents the hand of God as at work to bring perfect method and harmonious working into all the operations of his prepared instrumentalities. Let these prophecies be studied on your knees before God. 
Conclusion This study has given us an understanding of the manner in which God will use to separate the wheat and the tares in the church. The cutting of the traces allowed the bay horses to go to and fro through the earth to proclaim the last gospel invitation to the world and bring about the second brass mountain. The angels of God will come to separate the righteous from the unrighteous. After the separation, his great missionaries will establish that second great brass mountain, a mountain filled with the Spirit, a purified church. Where do you stand today? Your answer to that question means your very salvation. Amen. Okay. Um, do we have any questions, any comments? Sister Esther. That volume three, eighteen eighty eight materials. Where would I find it in the um Ellen White reference? I, yes. I, I've never seen it. Huh? It is there. On the on the what? On the um not the um, emotional. Type uh, like eighteen eighty eight, just put eighteen eighty eight space thirteen oh three. Okay. 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 Um, yes. Anyone else? Any other comments, questions? Okay, if there be none, I would just like to um, thank everyone for your attention, your participation. Uh, next Sabbath, We'll do a basic um, study on health. Uh, so invite you to, again, uh, stay tuned for next Sabbath. Also, I came to my understanding that some are having trouble uh, logging on. Uh, what you may have to do is update your app and restart your phone. Also, uh, you might be required to make an extra step in logging on because I think the option now is if you want to uh, join with audio or not. And so you have to pay attention to the prompts that it gives you and you should not have a problem, you know, coming into the conference call. Okay, I see another hand. Brother Terry, I thought you were coming to an end, so I just wanted to remind you that a brother had asked about the date, 508. Okay, that's correct. That's correct. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Let me just take a few more hands. There were two more hands here, and then I'll come back to the dates. Hello. Can you hear Hello, me? Hello, brother. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you, bro. Hey, I was just bringing to the attention of the people in case they're not aware. Um, you know, you had mentioned uh, in uh, one of the slides there uh, for the abominations to sigh and cry. Um, you know, when we're speaking to mother, if you t turn to volume five, page uh, 212, uh, it says the day of God's vengeance is just upon us. The seal of God will, place, will be placed upon the foreheads of those only who sigh and cry for the abominations done in the land. So it's it's uh, worded differently in volume five. And so when we're talking about the abominations to mother, I think it's important that we bring out the one that you said in uh, volume three, because that gets more specific where it shows up, uh, sigh and cry for the abominations done in the church. Mm -hmm. So I just want to bring that to the attention that if you're doing a study with mother, you might want to prefer to go with the the version of uh, chapter 3 because that gets a little more specific. Amen. Thank you. 
Okay, if I see a hand again. Yeah, um, concerning the updating of the app, I, I seem, I get cut off a few times, and it says, um, allow, allow them um, what to take pictures, um, deny or allow. So, I guess I put in deny and I go, I go off the um, the screen while this study is going on. That's that's what happens. So, what you think? Updating means when they ask that you put allow. Allow. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. So taking pictures just mean that I would see your uh, um, slides on the screen because it says allow. Um, what does it say? To take pictures. Yeah. In, in other yeah. words. Um, um, I'm not sure how it how it's working, but um, the fact that you can see pictures, it has something to do with your, um, you know, that portion of your your phone. because oh. it keeps cutting. I because I put deny. And, yeah, um, well, you have to say accept and and then see how that works, right? Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, hold on, let me just uh, check something else here, and then we'll come back to the okay. Um, all right, let's look at the 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 arch arches over there, <clears throat> and on the Far left, we see 508, then we see 538. Moving to the right, we see 1798, 1844, 1890, and 1930. So at the 508, as we follow the arch upward, we see 1290 years, Daniel 1211, and also 1335 years, Daniel 1212. And uh, so, let, so let's just read those verses. Daniel 12, verse. 11, and it says, And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that make it desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. So, what is the daily sacrifice? Well, in our study of Daniel chapter 8, um, the word sacrifice does not really belong in the text. So the daily has to do with the Sabbath. So from the time the Sabbath is taken away and the abomination put in its place, that is the year 508 that we're looking at. Okay. Um, I see a hand. I don't know if it has to do with this. Terry Mack. Terry Mack. Hello? Can you raise your hand? Yeah. 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 Um, 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 I'm here from two teachers. Number 22. Number 22. On page 22. The North Country okay. of Africa, the North of Palestine, North of is where the other chariots went. Other chariots went. That is. That is the countries which the Christian nations, Christian nations now inhabit. Now inhabit. So you, could, you could you explain that more fully to me? I have an idea, but I, I would like to get your understanding of that. Okay, so you're going back to the subject of the North Country? Yes. yes. Okay, 2TG number 22, page, what was that again? 
22. Okay. 2TG 22, page 22. Okay. Um, since the church originated in Asia, Jerusalem in particular, the first chariot is seen to have remained there, for it went nowhere. The North Country geographically north of Palestine is where the other chariots went. That is the countries which the Christian nations are now inhabiting. The fourth chariot, though, is supposed to go to and fro through the earth to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. But contrary to this, the grizzled horses go forth toward the south country, which figuratively speaking would be spiritual Egypt, worldliness. Now, can you repeat your question? Yes. Uh, I would just like to um, try to push more on the um, Christian nation and now inhabitants. More, more, just on that, that line is. Which will be the Western nation at Apostle. Uh, 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 yeah, like, like Europe, I guess you would say. That most, most, of, most of the Christian nations, because he's well, talking. I'm a shady, like American, Canada, and all that stuff. Well, um, I guess America is somewhat in north. In this, in this, and I, I get it. What he's saying is that, um, in terms of Jerusalem. Because we're looking at the actual physical location of Jerusalem, where the church originated. North of Palestine, right? He says, again, since the church originated in Asia, Jerusalem in particular, the first chariot is seen to have remained there, for it went nowhere. The North Country, geographically north of Palestine, is where the other chariots went. That is, the countries which the Christian nations are now inhabiting. The fourth chariot, though, is supposed to go to and fro through the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. But contrary to this, the grizzled horses go forth toward the South Country, which, figuratively speaking, would be spiritual Egypt, or worldliness. So, um, <clears throat> in 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 the instant he is talking symbolically, you know, the North Country, and we know that the North Country is where Babylon was. Now, many of the Christian nations, um, they are what you would call Protestant nations, Protestant or Catholic, whatever the case may be. And um, those who cling to the doctrines of Rome come also under the heading of Babylon. So in that sense, they are carrying their messages to the Christian nations, to Babylon. Now let's look again at the, the, the black horses. They go towards the north country. Okay, so this represents the period of time during the Dark Ages when there was no religious freedom, spiritual bondage. And they were laboring chiefly among their own people. And so that's why they, they went towards the North Country, but under conditions that were um, considered, you know, um, no, no religious freedom or during the time of the Dark Ages when the church basically restricted the, the progress of the people. The white horses likewise go to the North Country, but now uh, it is during a period of religious freedom. 
And William Miller, we are told, his message went to every Christian um, outpost that there was in the world. And so it would, of course, go to those nations as well. In Europe, in America, wherever Christ, you know, the Christian nations are. So, um, that that essentially is what this reading is bringing out. I don't know what were you, what were you thinking? No, I just want to give you a clarification about it. I was just thinking. I was just thinking. Yeah, that's the um where Christianity end up end up as the Western side. Knowing that America is the origination of Atlanticism and, and so forth. I saw more thought that it was referring to that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, okay, going back to the arches. So, 508 is the time that the um, Sabbath was taken away and the Sunday put in, in its place. And you notice that the arch goes to um, 1798. Now, let's look at uh, the other arch where he mentions um, Daniel 12.12, 12, right? Daniel 12.12 12 says, Blessed is he that waited and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. Which brings us to um, 1844. You go to the right, you follow that, the 1335 days, Daniel 12.12, 12, it lands at 1844. What happened in 1844? Well, that was when the Sabbath truth was restored to the church. 1844. Let's go back again to um, 538. The 1260 years. Daniel 7.25. Let's read Daniel 7.25, and it says here, um, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand, until a time and times and the dividing of time. So 538 is when the papacy took control, had that kind of power that even kings had to bow at their feet. And, of course, those who would exalt the truth were persecuted. They were given into his hands for time, times, and dividing of times. That's 1260 years. And 1798, we know, is when um, the Pope was taken prisoner, uh, bringing an end to the papal reign. So that is the reason for those dates there. Um, continuing on, 390 years, Ezekiel 4, verse 5, bringing us to 1890. The 390 years is when um, the Reformation had started, yes? And um, during the time of Reformation, that would be from 1500, Okay, from 1500 when uh, the Reformation started, if you look at the top of the arch, you'll see that little, uh, um, look like a cross with the A.D. 1500 on it. Um, that's when the Reformation started, so it brings us to 1890. Uh, 1890, what is the importance of 1890? 
that is when the last message uh, was was um, given time to work its effect. You know, the 1888 message that came, and then two years were given for the church to accept the 1888 message, which brought us to 1890. And, of course, the church, we know, rejected the message, so the message never fully developed. And, again, uh, the last arch there that brings us to 1930, the 40 years of Ezekiel 4, 6, um, 40 years from 1890 brings us to 1930 when with the arrival of the Shepherd's Rod message. So I hope that, um, you know, this makes it a little more clear. If, uh, if it's not clear, you can raise your hands and we'll see what we can, um, you know, answer more clearly. Okay. Well, I think that brings us to the end of this study. And again, I would like to thank you all for your participation. So at this point in time, we shall close mm -hmm. with a word of prayer. And um, I will ask um, uh, Brother Terry Mack, are you still with us? Uh, I'm looking for you on scant scrolling down. Uh, okay, I'm going to unmute you if you would like to close. Close with a word of prayer for us. Brother Terry Mack. Okay, uh, I guess you may have stepped away for a while, so we shall pray to close. Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful word of truth, this prophecy that you have given us from way back even before the Christian church came into being, showing us uh, that which will transpire even down to our day and the situation that we find ourselves in. And we look forward to the day, Lord, when... Uh, your church will be purified and we can go forward carrying this gospel into all the world. Help us to be faithful to the end that we may be among that number that will have that part to play in the glorious closing of this world's history, the end of sin and, and the setting up of your eternal kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Okay, brother, no, before you go again, I'd just like to make an announcement that um, uh, you may have received notice that in August, from the 1st to the 14th, uh, we will be having discussion on some of the um, items uh, that has become a, a point of discussion among the brethren in the field. And um, if you want to be able to participate, maybe ask questions or whatever, uh, you will need to register your name and the number that you will be you know, calling from to be allowed into the um, conference call. Uh, the reason for that is not that we're trying to exclude any, but uh, to avoid, you know, some coming in with uh, certain ideas of their own that will take us off of the subjects at hand. Okay, so just get in touch with the office and uh, let them know that you want to participate and so that your name can be added to the roster. Okay, so see you next Sabbath. God bless.